Now Lebel to the right hand, puts her down. He's going to jump him hard to the ice. Brady Lebel just loves to fight. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My dream of being a professional hockey player became a reality, but it was all taken away from me in a very short period of time. For many years, hockey was my outlet. Hockey was my drug. When I had a stick in my hand, nothing else mattered. I was able to break into the Western Hockey League in 2004, and I even won the Swift Current Broncos Rookie of the Year. During the summer of my rookie year, I experimented with drugs for the first time. After just seven games in my sophomore season, I walked away from the Swift Current Broncos due to personal reasons. Nobody knew I had been sexually abused at the age of five. I did everything to hide it from everybody, but I just couldn't take it. Drugs and alcohol now took over my life. I did return to the Swift Current Broncos as a 19-year-old, but things were never the same. I was eventually traded to the Kelowna Rockets in my final year of junior where I got to play on a line with the Dallas Stars captain, Jamie Benn, and one of my best friends, the extremely talented Colin Long. It was by far my best season ever, and I even signed with the Tampa Bay Lightning's organization. A dream come true, right? That's when everything went wrong. First it was the cocaine, then came the Oxycontin, and that led me into a 12-year journey into the deepest pits of hell. Within two years, I had now made the switch to heroin, fentanyl, and everything in between, and I was now an intravenous drug user. Multiple suicide attempts and over five trips to the psych ward, I was a shadow of who I once was. By 2014, I was homeless on Hastings in Vancouver, the worst street in North America. By 2015, I was a wanted criminal, making the Crime Stopper headlines more than once. After spending three years in jail, I had completely given up. With nowhere to turn and nowhere to go, I finally started to get honest. I took a chance and made some major changes. This is my story. 911, where's your emergency? Someone overdosed? What's the address? I overdosed over 10 times. I'm one of the lucky ones. And for that, I will always be grateful. This is for all the men and women we've lost. Matthew Wazinski, Mitch Fadden, this one's for you. My name's Brady Lebel, and I've been to hell and back. This is the road to recovery. What is going on? Welcome. Hockey to Hell and Back, episode number 104. I'm Brady Liebold, coming at you guys live from beautiful Muskoka, Ontario. I am one grateful human uh, tonight, and I'm going to try to hold back tears uh, because over the past month, I've been back on the ice coaching kids, and I'll tell you what, it is just an absolute gift uh, to be around the game of hockey and to be able to use not just my experience as a hockey player, but more importantly, my experiences in life to pass these on to the next generation. And I was nervous, like thinking like, how are parents ever going to let their kids work with a guy who spent three years in jail? I mean, you guys know my story. It wasn't pretty, but I'll tell you the feedback that I'm getting from the parents messages today, just from last night's skate, I've cried more times today, tears of joy than I have in a long time, hiding in my room, pretending like I'm sleeping most of the time. And I'm just going, wow, thank you. Like God, the universe, whoever, thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you for listening, for supporting anything that I've done, because without that love and support, I'm probably not here. I just, I can't tell you guys enough how grateful I truly am truly am. I'm going to talk more about it at the end of the show, but I'm super pumped to get Steven Johns in here to talk about Mental Miles, his career in hockey, and his battle with mental health. Uh, but before we bring in Steven, we're going to hear from one of my favorites, Regan Bartell, and the people over at Team Issued. We'll be right back. Hi there, it's Regan Bartell, the play-by-play -play voice of the Kelowna Rockets, Brady Leobold's biggest fan. Team Issued is connecting all walks of life. 
Team Issued does this by recreating that special feeling of being a part of something bigger. A community for all striving towards the same goal. TeamIssued.ca. Promo code TOEDRAG15 for 15% off. Thank you to Regan Bartell, Jesse Paradise, all the people at Team Issued. They've been with me since episode number three when the show was called Hockey to Heroin, The Road to Recovery. Quick story on that. I had you know guys like Doug Gilmore and all these people on, and I kept seeing this picture, Hockey to Heroin, The Road to Recovery. I'm like, that doesn't really sit well with me, <laughs> seeing Dougie Gilmore's picture there. Uh, I'm super grateful for Doug. He's been super kind. But uh, a friend of mine, friend of the show, Pete Fry, I asked him, I'm like, Pete, I need your help. I need a new name for the show. And he's like... Didn't even hesitate. He's like, hockey to hell and back. And I'm like, let's go, Pete. So uh, the first 70-something episodes was hockey to heroin, the road to recovery. Uh, but we've done 104 now, hockey to hell and back. Thank you to everyone for supporting this journey. But tonight is not about me. You guys get to hear so much about me. And this is one that I'm really excited for. And in my mind... This has been over a year in the making. I'm not sure if that's the case for Stephen. I'm sure it's not. He had a lot of stuff going on. Uh, but Stephen Johns from Wampum, Pennsylvania, a second-round draft pick of the Chicago Blackhawks, played his NHL career with the Dallas Stars. He played for the United States National Team World Juniors, the under-18s. This guy was a player, and he's been very open about his struggles with mental health and other things. And last summer, I guess at the beginning, of, was it last spring, end of spring? Stephen, you'll have to correct me on this when you come in. On a whim, him and a film guy set out to skate coast to coast on his rollerblades to raise awareness for mental health on the mental miles journey. And that's what caught my attention because... He wanted to share his story in hopes of helping others. And to me, that's why Stephen Johns, to me, is a hero. And I'm so grateful uh, for him. So without further ado, from Wampum, Pennsylvania, the man, Stephen Johns. Thanks for, having me. Thanks, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Hey, man, I appreciate it. We appreciate it. Before we go any further, thank you for your courage, for your bravery. Um, it's it's probably been a big uphill battle for you. Um, how are you doing these days, Stephen? Uh, I'm good. I, uh, yeah, it's been a little bit of a journey here these past couple of years, especially uh, throw COVID involved. I think everyone's had a, had a tough go of it. Um, but, you know, lately I've been good. I uh, was sick of the snow here in Pennsylvania, so... <laughs> Went and rented a place out in the, on the beach in California for a couple months and um, just kind of just trying to meet some people and figure out what's uh, what's next in life. Uh, I don't know. I'm not really uh, figured that one out yet, but uh, we're on a better path. That's for sure. That seems to be the million dollar question. Uh, certainly, I think for everyone, but I know for hockey players, uh, I, I know firsthand, as do you, uh, you and I have both kind of struggle to find find what it is next for hockey as pretty much every guest that's played pro hockey or even junior hockey that's been on my show well has told me the same so i want to talk a little bit about that later but tell us a little bit about young stephen johns and how you got your start in hockey and what hockey meant to you early on yeah i started skating at a young age we, had, we didn't really have much ice rinks or many ice rinks around um but my cousin that was four or five years older than me played hockey uh, because of mario and yeah. Um, I, so then my brother played and my brother was two and a half years older than me. So obviously I did whatever he did. So um, it just kind of the years went by and, uh, you know, you keep making those steps further and further. And uh, you know, all of a sudden it was time to whether we wanted to uh, do travel hockey or, or stay in double A. And we made a decision to do triple A and um, I actually got the I played with uh, Brandon Sod for five, six years and played with Michael Hauser, who's got who's played in the NHL. And, uh, you know, it was just a, it was an awesome time. No kidding, right? We go we go back and and I think of being young and, and just the, the memories that I have as a young hockey player. And I try to tell these kids that I've been coaching, like, this is the best time of your life. They're like 13, 14. They got... Uh, that fire in their eyes, um, but and, and I did too, but somewhere along the way, I lost that fire and hockey stopped working for me and my mental health. And I kind of want to talk to you about that because I heard you talk on, on a brief interview. Uh, you started to struggle with mental health pretty early on um, in high school. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I never was really open about it. Um, 
I never really realized it until I started working with a therapist, um, kind of talking about my past, you know, how my childhood friends, you know, treated me, how everything, you know, kind of unfolded throughout my college career. And, uh, you know, in my ways to the pros, um, I kind of realized that I've been struggling for a while and kind of everything just, I just kept everything bottled up for years and years. And, uh, yeah. And it's tough, right? Like when, so you said you didn't really know until you had a therapist and, and is that something you, you think you just kind of assumed as a hockey player, this isn't something we talk about and you got to just keep putting your head down in that warrior mentality. Uh, you went on to play for the, the fighting Irish in Notre Dame. You guys won a championship there. Um, what was it like, you know, going to college and in that kind of atmosphere where you dealing with some of the stuff then like when did you really start to pay attention to this and and how much were you willing to share or not share is it's again something that you just were like hey i'm not talking about this yeah i mean for the longest time i kind of had um you know a reputation of, of not being the, the best of guys not the best of teammates and you know for mm -hmm. for rightful reasons um don't really want to get involved in those but um just stuff that's, you know, scarred me from stuff that I think about every day that that's affected my life and affected my mental health and just kind of let myself get sadder and sadder and over the, over the, the weeks and the years and uh, kind of all just came to a halt, obviously, when, when everything, when everything happens. So it's a, it's a tough road to navigate. Um, but all of a sudden you're being drafted in the second round to Chicago. And that's obviously a dream come true for any hockey player. And certainly probably was for you. Do you remember what that day was like for you when you got drafted? We just, we just had the draft, the, the most recent draft here. And I see some of these young smiling faces and I often wonder how many of them are, are putting on a brave face. Was that the case for you? Oh yeah. I mean, <clears throat> no, I, I think, I, I had a, I had a really tough time because I won a gold medal and yeah. in my my U eighteen year and I hadn't I didn't play a shift in the semifinal or the final game, so that 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 was really hard for me to kind of you know everyone was congratulating for you know it's kind of when you win but you don't contribute it's kind of you're really happy and excited but you know you don't really feel part of the team and that kind of stuck with me throughout the summer but the draft happens and that kind of gets all wiped away because, okay, I get a fresh start in a new place. This team wants me. Um, and then it was kind of a, I kind of turned a new page on that, but didn't really deal with everything in my past when I needed to. And then kind of just left that in the rearview mirror not realizing it was all going to, it was all coming right back in a couple of years. So it, it's, it's hard, right? Steven, because, uh, you know, I talk to guys and in my own experience, when we're in that life of playing hockey, it's, it's, it's really from like one thing to the next. It's like, okay, when's the next practice? When's the next game? When's the next meal? And it, it's kind of almost hard to even take time to, to stop and, and digest everything that's going on. Um, is that something that you experienced as well? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I still struggle with structure in my life. I think it's, I've been told where to be, what to do for yeah. <laughs> every day. You know, I, my parents didn't let me play hockey in the summer. So I've literally had the same schedule every year of my life since I was four years old, where I didn't didn't was on the ice for three four months out of the year, and that's when I played other sports, when I hung out with friends. That's when I like really enjoyed life. And then kind of you know August would come around, you gear up mentally for the hockey season, and then once it's over, you kind of have this amazing like kind of sigh of relief, like oh okay, I get to hang out for a couple months and before yeah. the grind happens again. And I think. I think that grind started, you know, in the, at the national program because it kind of, you know, and, and I wouldn't change anything. I love that. I love that grind back, back, you know, whenever gearing up for a season and getting with the boys before a season, that's, that's the best time of the year. Um, but, you know, each summer would go by and that grind just seemed to be a little bit longer. Um, and then obviously injuries happen and uh, not being able to recover from injuries. Um, not even be able to play with injuries because, you know, as a hockey player playing with an injury, you play your best games. It's something <laughs> that's engraved in hockey players. And unfortunately it, uh, it snuck, it snuck up. I mean, um, I should have listened to my body at an earlier age. It's, it's hard though, right? Because it's such a competitive atmosphere where it's, it's dog eat dog. And even in, even in a team's dressing room, like your own team, it's still kind of dog eat dog. You're, you're, 
jockeying for ice time, power play time, penalty kill time. And so any amount of time off, all of a sudden, if you're slipping out and somebody hops in and now they're successful, it makes it that much harder for you to, to find your way back. Um, when did, what kind of injuries did you experience? Uh, and, and at what point in your career was it maybe your first, uh, I've heard you talk about concussions and stuff. Is that, was it one in the NHL or did you suffer through junior, the national program, NCAA, American league? Where did it all start for you? Uh, I mean, I played with, I, I actually didn't miss it. I've never, I never missed a game until I turned pro. And, uh, so I, I played every game in college and, uh, I mean, I knew I played with concussions, but I didn't know at the time, um, just figured I had a little headache, you know, got my bell rung and, you know, we didn't really have as strict of concussion protocols as I do now. And I, I don't even know how much they've changed, um, for better or for worse. I feel like guys are starting to fail them on purpose now, just so, so just so the scores are, are lower, you know what I mean? It's, uh. It's 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 hard to stomach the fact that everything's just uh, the impact test and that's it. Because I mean, I've passed that fifty times, and half of them I had a killer headache or you know I just just lie on them. It's just you know as as hockey players we just want to play. That's right. And uh, again, I, I had similar experiences, and and it's one of those things where you almost don't want to tell anybody because it's not an injury you can see. It's different if you fight a guy and break your hand and you got a cast on, you're like, hey, coach, hey, boys, I got this cast on it. And every, everybody, even the fans can see that, OK, hey, you know, you have a cast. You, you obviously can't play and you can't really hide that. But here you have this this head injury, this brain injury that's way more severe than a hand break. But so many athletes, so many hockey players, <coughs> excuse me, continue to push through that. And it's it's way too common. Uh, I'm not sure how to combat that. Um, what do you, I just ask you all kind of off the cuff here. Like, what do you think about the game as far as speed and no red line? Um, and, and maybe some things that we could do or the, the NHL down could do, uh, to maybe stop the concussions from happening so much. I mean, honestly, that's, that's where it's a tough position because we love the, we love that's, that's why everyone loves hockey is the physicality of it and the fights. And you, know, you talk to any player, nobody wants fighting out of the game. Yeah. I, mean, I don't want fighting out of the game. I think it's a it, it's a tool that decreases concussions. Because yeah. I mean, everybody knows when Ryan Reeves is on the ice. <laughs> you know, it's 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 something that's in the back of your head, and uh, you know, it, it, hopefully, it, it it's tough because I the feel game's like so fast, and you can't take you can't take the physicality away from it, and and like the the hit that got me that ended me wasn't a dirty play, wasn't a it was just kind of you know, bad luck at the in the wrong place, wrong time. And uh big guy hit me and my head was the only thing he got. So it's, it's tough to say, what do you, what can you change? It's such a fast game, especially now. It is. It's, it's ridiculously fast, but I do agree with you on the, on the fighting is um, there wouldn't be guys running around so fast, even trying to hit guys if they knew they had to answer the bell, like they did back in the day. I still think, there's that accountability piece, um, but I, I I don't I agree with you. I, I don't think you're you can get concussions. Obviously, you can't get them out of the game completely. But I'm not sure how we slow them down. Some people have these these ideas of making the two you know the two line pass, bring that back. Maybe that's going to help. But again, like you said, so many times yourself included, it's plays where it's not like an abrupt hit. It might just be a fluke. You what you see Sidney Crosby right a couple times where he's just not looking, turns and hits his head, and that's it. Um, walk me through a little bit what the experience was like after, uh, suffering that career ending concussion and, and sort of maybe the dark times is as much as you want to tell us, Steven, um, you know, because I know it wasn't easy and it's probably not easy to talk about. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's becoming easier to talk about because I've seen how much my stories help people. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely still a touchy subject, but I mean, it's kind of like any other concussion, um, but this one, the headaches just never went away. And about two or three months into the off season, uh, I was back at home and went and got checked up by the one of the doctors who was involved in creating the impact test, actually, that, the, that we use. So, you know, a very well-respected neurologist. And he said my headaches were from, you know, depression and anxiety. And I should go back and live my life. And at that time, it was, you know, I just signed an extension and 
I was that pretty much in the, in the happiest state of life I could ever been in, but I had this killer headache every second of every day. And uh, he kind of just told me to go back and to live my life and having beers with the boys and um, my headaches would go away. And I didn't really, I just kind of listened to him and then tried to train all that summer. And then I just showed up training camp and couldn't even get through practice. And uh, yeah, just from there, it was just a, just a snowball effect. How was that for you going in, like say, take us back to that practice, let's say, and you're going back to camp, you're on this extension, you're living your dream, playing for the Dallas Stars. And uh, what is that conversation like with with the team? And and is that something that you brought forward? Is that something that they came and said, hey, Stephen, like we can see something's wrong here? Um, uh, and- yeah, I mean, I, I definitely came forward with it. Um, and that's where, you know, my experiences with the, with the general manager, Jim Nell was honestly the, I, I couldn't have experienced that. I think a better, I, I don't know where I'd be if I was in a different um, organization, to be honest. I came to him right away and asked him if I could go seek help. And, you know, I went for 10 days in the middle of training camp to figure it out. And, you know, that was really hard for me because I, the, the year before I felt like the last two, three months, I really figured out how to play in the NHL. And, um, had a you know had a just a really good feeling about my career because it was kind of up and down. I was up and down through the minors and just didn't really feel part. Didn't really feel like I belonged in the NHL. Mm. And then I finally did, and uh, you know I show up to training camp and everyone's talking about you know me being paired with Haskinen all year, and it's like that's a dream D mm. partner. <laughs> like uh, you know I think he's one of the best in the league right now, and yeah. um, to not even be able to go through a practice and then. You know, a month goes by and then three months go by and then six months go by. And not only aren't the headaches going away, but they're getting worse. And kind of everything that we're doing to try to get them to go away, it's, it's not working at all. Um, and every time I seek a different different help with a different doctor, um, it was fail, 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 fail. And it's just, uh, yeah, I started having mental breakdowns in x-ray rooms whenever they told me I was completely fine just because I needed some of them to someone to tell me that something was wrong with me. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty, uh, I went to a dark place, started, uh, not really being able to sleep and eat and, uh, started abusing, abusing some drugs and, uh, yeah, kind of leave it at that. And, um, yeah. Well, uh, you know, thank you for sharing that, right? Like, that's not an easy thing to talk about. And uh, as you mentioned, it's getting easier for you. And I'm sure after the documentary, we'll talk about that a little bit, because I want to I really want to hear about your journey across the states. But as you continue to do this, it's going to get easier. But just know that, you know, it's very common uh, in the hockey world. Uh, You know, we as hockey players, I've found that it you almost need that that outlet. (sighs) it feels like right when you don't when you can't do what you love to do and certainly you weren't getting the answers you were looking for it's a really painful place to be in right so searching out some sort of relief just to take that emotional pain away um, sometimes physical pain too um, it can be a really slippery slope we don't have to go any further into that but i just want to say thank you for sharing that piece um, especially because that's probably the hardest thing i find uh, for people to admit that maybe they did do some some drugs and use some substances but it's really important to remember that there's a reason why people do that in the first place and it's just because they're trying to feel better and certainly you were not getting the answers that you needed nor uh where you deserve them like you you deserve those answers and when you're feeling uh in that you're you're feeling that immense pain the headaches the emotional pain uh and and you're trying to explain yourself and the best of the best can't give you an answer i can't even imagine what that must have felt like so you're an absolute warrior um when did or if did the headaches ever stop for you no and i still still i uh, just kind of fig- figured a way to live with them um nothing really kind of what i wake up with is what i got uh, i've tried still re- still like working with different doctors and uh yeah i don't know just gonna keep trying until uh i had three days on my rollerblading trip where i didn't really have a headache but i think that was more for more placebo effect i think i was more high on life than anything 
I but, love, uh, I love yeah. to hear that. I love yeah. to hear that, uh, that you had at least those three days and you're able to get that sort of natural high and just kind of probably almost felt like a little boy again, right? Like roll, they, on that trip. And let's, let's just fast forward. We can always come back to stuff. There's nothing structured about this show at all, nor my life. I'm much like you. I have zero structure in my life. <laughs> um, so take us back um, just over a year ago. Um, you and your friend, the videographer for, I think the Dallas stars, yeah, right? Jeff, Jeff totes. Yeah. Jeff totes. So this is, this is you and him here before you took off. Right. Yep. Yeah. It's uh, like right before we left. Uh, and this happened, what a couple days in the making, you're like, Hey, I'm going to do this. And he's like, I'm in and, uh, Tell us a little bit about how that came to be and how you got started and, and what the initial feeling like was when you took off on those blades. I saw the video coming over the bridge, police escort. Pretty awesome, man. I, I remember almost like tearing up. I'm like, this guy's gonna this guy's gonna move mountains with what he's doing and people are gonna listen. So really again, really proud of you for doing it. But tell us a little bit about how that came about and where the idea came from. Yeah. So uh I mean, kind of spur of the moment thing. I texted him and I uh, wasn't even planning on doing a documentary or anything. I just I had talked to him probably two or three weeks before and knew that he was off for the summer. Or he was he had taken another job away from the stars. And um, I kind of came across this video of a guy walking across the country, um, Mike Posner. And it kind of inspired me. And I texted him and said, I'm going to roll a blade across the country. Do you want to come with me? And he's like, yeah, I'll come. And if if we make a documentary sweet if not let's just have a sick road trip and uh we left two days later <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> he, flew, he flew from dallas to here we went to went to the store to get a bunch of chairs and camping stuff everything was fresh out of the bag and kind of threw everything in the back of the truck and just went wow and you started from your hometown right yeah yeah it started in my hometown and um yep made it all the way to oregon oregon wow what a journey man and uh like when you first started you know you're coming over the bridge and you have this sort of great send-off and then all of a sudden it's just you and him and there's nobody in some of these pl clandestine places what was that like for you was that peaceful were there hard times uh did you ever question being like holy shit what did i get myself into uh, <clears throat> I mean, I got really lucky because I have two really good friends that live in Ohio. So they met me about four hours into the first day and then about six hours into the second day. So those, and those days were brutal because I was fresh skates, blisters everywhere. Um, that was, that was the, honestly the first day, the first like night, I wasn't, it wasn't what did I get myself into? It was, I don't know if I can do this because I had such bad lace bite. Ooh. And yeah, if you, Ooh, yeah, yeah, that's the, the worst, lace, man. I'll tell you what, there's no lace bite like I like anyone's ever experienced and what <laughs> I experienced on the trip. But you have bunga pads or what were you no, using? We tried your... literally everything. At the end, it was we just took everything out because the more we added, the more pressure there was. Wow. So it was just yeah, but it was uh, honestly not not one time that I think like I, I'm not gonna do this. Or what did I get myself into? It was. It was awesome, man. Every every day was, we ran into one day where it rained and we had to drive. But other than that, it was smooth sailing. It's 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 just an incredible year. I'm so pumped to see the documentary and see the footage. And uh, uh, you stopped off at Notre Dame and and got to go back to your old school. I know you went through Chicago. You met up with some other NHL former NHLers and current NHLers. Tell us a little bit about all that. Yeah, so we did. Kind of just where I live, I kind of tracked my entire career. We went through Ann Arbor, where the program used to be, and um, yeah. then to Notre Dame, and then to Chicago to draft, and then to Minnesota, where the hit that ended my career was. So it was like wow. from, and then after Minnesota was when all the <laughs> epic stuff happens in South Dakota and Wyoming and Idaho, and those are the cool states. <laughs> and it was kind of uh, kind of really cool how the whole documentary comes together and how the story gets told and. Um, really excited to share it just because <clears throat> I know if I didn't come across that YouTube video, I don't think I'd be here. And hopefully, I mean, not hopefully, but I mean, if, if my video can change one person's life, like that video changed mine, then that's like, I don't really, uh, yeah, that's, that's, it's awesome to me. 
it's all worth it, right? I, I heard you talk about um, th those states. You're talking about the epic part of the journey, South Dakota. They don't really play sports there, but you were able to connect with some pretty awesome people. And it all of a sudden wasn't about, you know, uh, hockey and everything else. It became, is that really where you, you really started to connect the, the dots with seeing how much this was going to change people's lives and impact people? That that happened about two hours into the trip. Um, okay. We stopped at a gas station to fill up and ran into some little like 14, 15 year old kid. And he like showed my, he pull, pulled his phone out of his car and showed me the picture of my Instagram that I was rollerblading across. The, we just had a great interaction with him. And he was like, this made me a great mood. Like I was having a bad day and now I'm excited. I'm so pumped to see you. And like from there on, it was like, okay, this is going to be, this is going to be pretty crazy. And then, I mean, to be able to raise $40,000 without any organization <laughs> at all. Um, and, you know, with a huge help from the Dallas Stars Foundation and Chelsea Livingston, um, you know, we put together kind of a, a little foundation there with in, in about five days. And, you know, a lot of people were, were on board and buying the T-shirts. And I don't know, it was just so fun to, to, to interact with people online and kind of, hear from so many people like they, I don't know who you are but you know I'm following your journey and it's been uh it's been awesome is is there been a residual carryover like since then since you stopped I know there's a lot of people going Stephen when's this documentary coming out we or you know like what what can we expect when can we expect to see it and I know you and I talked a little bit about it before but people are really excited to see this and I'm one of those people what's the uh consensus message that people can expect through this documentary uh I guarantee you'll never see somebody rollerblading across I-90 in South Dakota ever again. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I think that I my it's it's a it's a I tell my story from start to finish. Um, I kind of give all the details with you know the, with more details to come afterwards, and um, and I'm just really excited to to finally get my message out there, and it kind of feels like something that's been on my chest here for you know six months since we kind of put it put the final product together, and just kind of getting some pushback now, and uh, waiting to get some final clearance on a couple of things, and then we're good to go. And uh, we want hopefully we want to get it out in in September October uh, kind of time frame, but obviously still waiting to to hear on some things, but. Well, I, I, I'm hoping that it can come out as soon as possible for so many reasons. Obviously, for you, um, it's probably going to be... Do you think it'll be emotional for you? Uh, I know you've seen it and you've shown it to a few, a handful of, of people. Um, what was it like uh, watching it for the first time? Uh, I mean, I've watched it a whole bunch of times now just because through the editing process with Jeff. and um, But yeah, showing it to a couple uh, a couple close friends and a couple people I didn't know at all just to get some outside views... Uh, it, it was definitely probably the most nervous I've ever been just because wow. it's a, a true peak in, inside my life and, and my story that, you know, unfortunately not, not a lot of people that are close to me want to hear because they don't really know the, the whole story yet. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky to still be here today and I have a platform to, to hopefully save some people and, and inspire some people's and, and uh, if I can do that, then I don't, I don't really care about anything else. Well, you, you've already you've already successfully done that because I'm one of those people, and I can just see on social media um, how many people feel the exact same way from hockey players down to people who don't play hockey, probably don't even know what hockey is. You really are using your platform and your story to sort of get eyes on these topics, right? Like, yes, I played in the NHL. No, I'm not playing in the NHL anymore. But just the fact that you were a Dallas star, second round pick, U.S. National Development Program, gold medal, uh, NCAA championship, that's all stuff that you will always have in your back pocket. And because of that, uh, you know, people will more easily pay attention to this kind of stuff. And I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, you know, the guys that I idolized, you know, Pavel Bure, Paul Correa, those type of guys, I thought they were superheroes, right? Like they have no issues. All these guys in the NHL, they have no issues. They don't drink. They don't do drugs. Like when I was little, right, as a kid, and, and that they're just absolute warriors. But as I found out, 
many of them have, that I looked up to have been on this show and sat here the same you have and told, you know, similar stories, uh, experiences of the challenges, the stresses, the pressures. Um, but I'm, I'm so thankful that you found the strength and the, and the courage to kind of do that. Um, what was the initial reaction from, from your parents and your immediate family when you, when you uh, started to, first off, experience these kinds of things and how much were you willing to share with them? Um, <clears throat> that's a very, uh, yeah. Um, want to skip that they, one? No, they did. No, it's, it's fine. They, uh, it was hard for them to understand why I was rollerblading across America. Um, you know, it's where, where I'm from. It's a very small community. I'm from a town of 600 people. Oh, wow. Um, I've, yeah. I've had the, my, my family lives here. Um, my brother lives next door to me. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, it's one thing it, it, when I was kind of, you know, for two and a half years, I kind of shut everyone out and they didn't really know what was going on. And when I told them I was doing this, they didn't really understand. And, and rightfully so, um, didn't kind of give them any context. And, you know, I kind of let them know a couple of days prior why I was doing it. And, you know, it was just pretty evident to me how supportive they were, you know, from the start. So it was, uh, yeah, huge to have them for sure. It must have been it. It must have been hard uh, for your parents to to witness their son going through um, this just extreme uphill battle. Um, when really you like, I want to say that you know you're going to play with Miro Hiskin in that year, and that's uh, if you're healthy, you're in your the prime of your hockey career, right? Like, and I'm not trying to say like that's just the the facts. And I, I you know, I never even hit the prime of my hockey career, and it. <sighs> Like how alone did you feel and how much support did you have from either current or past teammates, the hockey community? Uh, we don't have to get into specifics, but what was the, the, it seemed like it was overwhelming love and support when you decided to rollerblade, but, yeah. prior, to, but prior to that, people maybe didn't know the extent of what you were struggling or dealing yeah. with, but what was that like for you? And, and were there times when you felt like you were just so alone and that, you know, because, and I'll say this because sometimes when I was struggling and it was like, wow, there's like, I, I would have went to war for these guys, man. I would have died for these guys. Like, and, and where, where's the, where's the team? Where's the support now? And granted, I, I deserved a lot of them not giving me that support as I told you before. And I'm, that's not even what I'm talking about, but tell me your experience with that. Like, was there, was there a, a group of people that rallied around you or were you left to kind of deal with this on your own? I mean, yeah, I had an amazing support system, but I think as, as hard as that support system tried, I, I just, I mean, I, I, just, I watched two full seasons of from the from the press box and watched my team go to lose in the Stanley Cup final in the bubble um, after playing in the first round. And um, those were probably the darkest days of my, of my life, uh, watching my team lose or when not being a part of it. Um, yeah, just cause that's all you really have is, <laughs> I mean, I didn't go to, I, as much, as much as I love Notre Dame, I didn't go to Notre Dame to go to school as you know, that's the famous quote from one of the quarterbacks that went to Ohio state, but, um, I went there to, to, to further my career to make it to the NHL. And that was literally on my mind since the age of four. And when it's kind of taken away from me, but I'm still part of it and watching it, but I'm not a part of it at all. Um, you know, then COVID comes along and just makes it so easy to isolate. And when you're on long-term IR, they don't want extra bodies around. So it was the easiest thing to do to just be alone. So yeah, it was, it was pretty yeah. brutal. That's the thing, right? Like you talk about long-term IR and even being hurt, let's say, uh, you know, you're hurt in the bubble Stanley cup, playoffs finals you're still in the press box but i've been in the press box and it certainly doesn't feel like you're part of the team and it's sort of it's for me anyways it was almost awkward if there's a long time off and you, you're going into the room and you're sued after and and you're starting to see guys click and they're enjoying some success um or not um sometimes they're you know your team can be in the trenches and, and you just feel like man i just want to be part of that too to to battle with these guys and I, I just, man. Like more so, I wanted to be in the locker room with, for the losses because I felt like I had just finally got to the part of the, my career where I was 
felt established in an organization that really liked me and wanted me there like for long term and in terms of you know not not eight or nine years but i think for the next couple of years and um <clears throat> just kind of felt like everything was just falling into place finally and uh all of a sudden you know in the blink of an eye it was taken away and then um sitting up there and and just watching for two years it just took a toll on me and then i kind of just forced myself to come back and that was probably the worst decision i made but one that almost probably felt like you didn't have a choice. Like, what else yeah. were you going to do, right? This, yeah. is, this is what I do. I'm a hockey player. I'm going to keep playing because this is, this is my life. And I'm glad, I'm, I, I'm glad I tried to come back because I don't think I would have been able to live with myself as a hockey player yeah. saying, like, I what if, you know? And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for <laughs> three and a half years, I tried literally everything and everything I could to, to get better and uh, – just nothing happened. Uh, the search is still on, but I'm not gonna not gonna stop. You're, you're, I have no doubt, man, that you're gonna find your way. And I'm, you know, this documentary and what you've done, the work that you put in, and, and your strength to share your story is, is gonna is gonna build a life for you that means way more than hockey ever would. And that is a bold statement. And it, and I don't know how you're feeling. I I'm hoping that you're already starting to sort of feel that way. I, I did see this, and I want to share this picture. Maybe I was always meant to be more than a hockey player. Maybe this is how I can have an impact. And you've already made a tremendous impact, but I think that's just the, that's just the start of your journey. And um, it, it's really inspiring to see. And I want to ask you a question, and, and you can answer it in, in as much or as little detail, or you can be like, next. You can you know, skip it. But during that time you know, two years off, how often were people, and we don't have to go into specifics, how often were people generally, you know, checking in on you and seeing how your mental health was? Is this something that was widely talked about? And I ask you not to blame a certain organization or team or league or anything. I'm just wondering, because I think overall, as people in the world, we need to do a better job checking in on one another. So what was that like for you? No, I think that you know, at the end, yeah, I had, you know, from every step, I had people reaching out to me to check in on and seeing how I was doing, and, you know, especially from, from, from the GM and the assistant GM and, yeah. you know, trainers and, and strength guys. And, you know, everyone was worried about me and it was kind of, I just didn't have updates to give them because nothing was getting better. And um, <clears throat> it got to a point where I didn't want to be a distraction anymore. So I tried to hide in the corners of the locker room and not be seen. And, only talk when I wanted to, to talk. And, uh, yeah, that was uh, a mistake that I made, but, uh, definitely not for the lack of lack of effort from them. But, and that's, that's a really tough, a tough one. Right. And it, it's interesting. You said you didn't want to be a distraction, right? Because then all of a sudden was it, was it maybe like you're in your own head, you're questioning like, why am I even here? Um, and, and that kind of stuff. And like, what, man, I, I just sorry you had to go through that, but I'm telling you right now, this is just a, a part of the story that's going to be so much more than even if you guys would have won that Stanley Cup and you were playing and you were on the ice when you won. I'm telling you, the stuff that you're doing and will do down the road is going to be more impactful to this world and to you than any trophy could ever bring. And I don't know if you agree with that statement yet, but I hope we can have a conversation in a year, two, three, whenever it is, and you're like, hey, yeah. Like this is better than any Stanley Cup because look at look at what's happening, right? You're creating conversations and encouraging people to get help and, and letting them know that, hey, yeah, I played in the NHL, you know, and, but look, here I am. I struggle. We all struggle. Um, did, did you get diagnosed with any mental illness um, from the doctor? And was that a struggle going from one to the next and everyone's trying to tell you it's something else? Or was there a pretty uh, rigid a diagnosis and then once that happened if it happened uh, medications um, is that something that's part of your life or that's something you want to talk about tonight um so yeah i um i mean i was um diagnosed with just like post concussive syndrome okay pretty much by everybody every neurologist that i saw um as far as medications i mean i've <laughs> where do you want to start they try <laughs> Every doctor tried me on a different one. Uh, I tried antidepressants, anti-inflammatory, tried different steroids, um, did the Botox, nerve blocks, um, blood patches. I mean, we go on and on, but um, <clears throat> yeah, um, 
Well, I what mean, I, and then I forget the last part of the question. Oh, what? Well, so do I. How, welcome, <laughs> welcome to, welcome to, you know, the short-term geez. memory loss. Yeah. Oh man, my short-term. I had a lot of concussions too, and I'm telling you, my short-term memory is horrible. But my long-term memory is really good for some reason. But my short-term yeah. memory is not good. But going through all those treatments and those medications, um, did you find anything that brought you some sort of relief? Uh, maybe not so much with the concussions, but maybe with the depression um, and those really hard times. And where are you at today with that? Is there something that works for Stephen Johns? Yeah, it was, you know, I've tried different antidepressants and honestly, they, they didn't do much for me. Yeah. Um, I really need a, a way to turn my brain off. And for me, like my, I've, I started meditating a lot. And uh, that's really helped me, you know, wake up in the morning in kind of a calm state because I usually wake up uh, and, you know, what do I have to do in kind of a freak out mode that I didn't do something yesterday. And uh, and then I, I started microdosing mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's let's go. Uh, I, was, I, I wasn't going to go there, but it's changed my life too, yeah, man. Yeah, it's um, it's it's pretty, it's been pretty awesome. Um, you know, I've done different different trials of them and. Um, just trying to figure out a program that works best for me. But. Thank you for sharing that. That's been a hot topic on this podcast. Riley Cote has been on three times and uh, he's sort of the guy in the hockey world leading that, that space. Ryan Vandenbush, he's big in that too. He's going to be talking a lot about that. He's been on the show. I was just with him a couple of weeks ago. He's like right into uh, he's got trials in Jamaica farms. They've they got the whole thing, plant medicines going on. And I want to just, you know, remind people, and they've heard me say this before, just because we're talking about this doesn't mean that that might be right for you. But I also think it's really important for this conversation to be had, because if we don't talk about what is helping us, regardless of what it may be with, and you know, I'm not talking about like hard drugs or anything, because that is just it, there's no helping there. It feels like it's helping for a short time, but then it, you know, it just takes over your life and takes everything from you. But the plant medicines for me, man, gave me my life back. And yeah. that was something for, for me, like in the recovery world, like I was an addiction IV drug user for like 10 years, man. I go from the American league to homeless in like three years on Hastings in Vancouver. And it wasn't for a lack of like not trying. Like I went to probably 10, 11 treatment centers, 10, 12, 13 detoxes, you know, counseling therapists, antidepressants, this, that, the other meetings, like 110 meetings in 90 days, you know? Um, but I, I always felt like there was something missing. And for me, my story is that all the stuff that the doctors were throwing at me were just trigger that, that part of my brain that would go back to the street drugs. Like, it's like, well, this is making me feel the same sort of way. And now I'm going on these uppers and they're trying downers. And then I'm like, you know what? I, I, it yeah. always put me back there, but it was really hard to navigate this time around early on because I was really using cannabis early on as part of uh, my healing. But it was like I was being judged from people being like, well, you're a drug addict. And you're like, oh, what? You're microdosing mushrooms. You're, you're, you're a drug addict. You shouldn't be doing this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but are you on Xanax or clonazepam or, or like antidepressants? Because I'm pretty sure those are mood altering drugs as well. But yeah. if that works for you, that's great. But guess right. this is working for me. And I think it's really important just to allow people to have a greater understanding of what that support and community looks like. Like if someone's doing something that's working for them and it's not hurting themselves or other people, then what the hell are we, like what business do we have judging anybody for their recovery journey, right? right? Mm -hmm. What about, <sighs> I'm, I'm quite aware and, and you probably are too of, you know, current pro hockey players who use this kind of medicine, um, throughout the year are you, is this something that's you know talked about within a circle of hockey players that are currently playing have you heard any of this uh I, honestly when i was around there wasn't much i mean there was talk of it but nothing i mean i i think guys were kind of afraid to start doing it at the beginning but i i, I would hope that guys start to use it more than the other uh the other alternatives that every doctor tries to put everyone on um but like you said if it, it works for some people and um if you're comfortable with, and it's not even like an experiment, you know what I mean? It's just like, I don't know. But think about that though. Every time you go and fill a prescription from a doctor and you haven't tried that, that drug or that antidepressant, whatever you want to call it, isn't that an experiment too? Yeah. <laughs> Those yeah. doctors have no idea how that may affect you versus me versus Jim versus, you know, Joanna over here, whoever, everyone's different. And my overall you know, picture of the the whole medical field that I dealt with 
was there was no one doctor that really actually knew what was going on or actually tried to figure out a solution rather than here, take this pill and everything will be okay. And it's like, okay, well now I'm feeling like a zombie. Now I can't, you know, I'm not feeling like myself. And then for me, I went to an even darker place because of all that. And I was like, wow, I'm like this forever. And uh, I don't know how much longer I can go on like this. And, um, I just, I just wish there was a easier path for people to actually find those answers. And obviously you agree with me too, cause you're still finding, trying to find those answers. Uh, do you, do you find that the, the microdosing has helped with the post concussion syndrome at all? A little, I mean, it's definitely helped with mood and anxiety. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I feel like I still have my bad days where it gets spurts of depression, but, um, I feel like I recognize though, and I have those and I have my, you know, mechanisms to get out of the, those state of minds. So you rollerblade uh, for that? I, I still rollerblade a lot. Yeah. Uh, when I was out in California, I rollerblade almost every day. And then, um, yeah, since I've been back going to the state park every once in a while and, and, and throwing them on and ripping, but um, are you still are you still on are you still on the roller blades like the long distance ones or are you on oh, like yeah. you like those oh, ones? Yeah. Eh? No, 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 I don't think I'll ever switch from the long distance ones. They're just you go way too fast to ever switch. Really, they and, cruise. Oh, you eh? fly, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm gonna have to try some of those out. I got I, I wear like true custom roller blades. They were really great. Send me some because I don't know if you know this. I was actually supposed to rollerblade Canada like right now like i'd planned it like last year but because of covid we were going to do like events all across canada and then in january we had to cancel it but when i saw you doing i was like well like you know i honestly thought it was like, okay well maybe if i do it maybe he can come up for part of the canadian journey and and do that but i ha i wanted to talk to you maybe like in a couple of weeks about an idea that i have where it's not just me doing it i really want to do something um and, and try to include a lot of people sort of like a baton pass like a hockey stick pass and get people involved because yeah. rollerblading for me uh it, like I told you before we came on, it, it saves me on, on many days. Like it's something that I can count on. Um, if I'm, you know, if I'm really struggling, I, I throw those rollerblades and my headphones in and everything just disappears. If, if it's for an hour, sometimes I'll do like a hundred K. I don't know how many miles that is in a day. hundred. I think I did like 130 was my most last summer. How many miles were you going on, on an average day when you were cruising there? Yeah, so we would we kind of set out to try to get 100 miles east or west every day, whether that was I mean because there was a lot of there was some driving too. Yeah, um, because we would hit a road. We weren't going on highways or anything. I wasn't trying to endanger my life. I wasn't get out, Stephen. It's a yeah. dirt road. Get going, buddy. <laughs> yeah, so it was uh, a lot of we we did come up on a lot of gravel roads because we were out in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, then if there was a hill, I kind of gave the hitch arm out and he'd come up and I'd hold on to the truck and he'd, he'd rip me out of it. I love um, that. But yeah, it was, uh, I think on the most, the most days, I think we did around like 60 or 70, wow. like actual on the wheels. And um, we kind of wow. would set the beginning of the day, we would kind of look at our route and then set where we want to get to that night and find a camp spot or a hotel. And uh, it's pretty, I can, it's pretty I can awesome. Wait to see this documentary. Um, I saw you met up with Bobby Ryan too. Is that right? Is he part yeah. of the, is he part of the documentary? Yeah, he's in it for a bit. Uh, he tells his story. Um, what it, right when I set out and did it, he reached, he was like one of the first guys to reach out to me and, um, kind of wish me good luck. And he was proud of me for doing it. And, uh, it let him know when we were swinging through his town. So we kind of, we, we made a big detour to go and, uh, include him in the documentary and include him in the journey. And, um, Obviously, he's done a, an amazing job and showing his sharing his story and um, inspiring a lot of people. And obviously, there's a lot of people that, that struggle with uh, with what he went through, too. So um, don't want to speak on behalf of him because yep. it's his story to tell. So, um, yeah. And, and I think there's probably a lot of people that are familiar with that story. I mean, that first game back was just incredible for him. But is this is that him behind you there? Yeah. yeah. That's him on the left. Yeah. Yeah. What's with the Vegas Golden Knights helmet? Oh, no, it's Notre Dame. That's the Golden oh, that's, oh, yeah. That's, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. There yeah. it is. There it is. Uh, yeah. They were the first to do it, eh? Like, way before it was a oh, thing. Yeah. So, when we were, I think it was my sophomore year, our our helmets and, like, lacrosse's helmets, baseball helmets were all just kind of a brown. And then we had the winter clot. We had an outdoor game, and they painted them, like, like the 
like the uh, football helmets. And then we kind of didn't go, didn't I think go back after that? Cause they're pretty, they're pretty juicy. They are. Yeah. But, a lot, but a lot of people either, you either love them or you hate them. Well, I think if you're wearing them for sure, it's like one of those things where, I don't know, you got a gold helmet on, like yeah, feel, feel golden out there, man. It, yeah. I love it. I, I don't know why I just automatically thought of the Vegas gold Knights, And as soon as I said, it, I'm like, Oh my God, there's another picture. Of course, <laughs> of course it's the fighting Irish. Um, so you you mentioned hopefully in September, um, uh, end of September, October ish for the the release of the documentary. Pending everything goes well, stuff we're not going to dice into tonight. Um, but is there a way that you guys are set to re release it? Like, is this something that's going to be on? Um, how are you going to release this documentary so that all of us can take it in? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's one thing we're still working through because we're still get, waiting to get kind of the clearance on footage and a um, couple few things still to hammer out before we submit it to any film festivals or any um, any kind of platforms that maybe want to have it or, you know, we might just throw it up on YouTube. We're kind of all of our options are on the table. So we uh, we just wanted to get out and we're not really worried about making money on it. <laughs> we just want people to, to interact with it and uh, kind of see where what goes from there because I think that hopefully it, it – uh, Hopefully it takes off a bit and uh, helps some people out and uh, we can kind of run with it in the future. It's going to help a lot of people, man. I'm telling you, it's going to help a lot of people. I haven't even seen it, but I've just seen clips uh, of you rollerblading. Like just seeing you come over that bridge and then rollerblading down some of these, just the very small glimpses that people have been able to see through your social media and stuff makes like the hair on my arms stand up, man. Like honestly, because it's, it, I can't I try to put myself in that position um, and it's impossible to do so. It's a lot going on in your life, right? Yeah. Your dream is over, but here you are and you're like, fuck this. I'm going to do something so that, you know, I, you know, people know that they're not alone. Like if, if I'm feeling like this, somebody else is definitely feeling like this. And by doing this, it's going to change people's lives. Did you, did you expect um, sort of the response that you got because I remember when you set up, it was everywhere, man. Like everywhere, it was like headline news. Like and it came out of nowhere, and it was like you said, two days in the making, and then the next thing you're on this just incredible journey. Um, did were you prepared for um, the the people that would reach out to you and how they would respond? Um, and how has that been since then? Um, are there still people that that send you messages and and, and share their story with with you? And um, how do you handle that on a daily basis or weekly basis? Yeah, I mean, I still get messages um, from people that come across the probably the Mental Miles hashtag or something, and um, it's 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 really cool. I uh, there's there's been so many different experiences in person online. Um, just yeah, it's been. I, I honestly can't even put in the words some of the some of the stories I've heard. Um, we ran into this girl in Oregon, um, and she had worked in some capacity with the stars in the past. And you know, we ran into her, and I got a message from her mom like two months later, and it was like, "Hey, just want to let you know, like, I think you running into my daughter saved her life." Um, wow. You know, she she talked about how impactful it was, and she was out there like looking for, you know, something mm -hmm. and um yeah just kind of a moment like that that really puts a lot of things into perspective and um you know some some people can call me a loser for rollerblading with a gold helmet on but i don't know i uh, i think it's pretty cool Dude, you're a hero anyone that wants to call you a loser needs to check themselves and and look take a good hard look in the mirror i have yet um through anything that i've read conversations that I've had with people uh, when I knew you were doing it. Um, I have never heard, and and maybe you have, but I have never heard anybody be like, yo, that guy's a loser. Like, no. <laughs> have you got any of that? Have you actually uh, got a couple. Hate I mean, a couple, in, a couple in person and yeah, a couple online. Oh. But I mean, you're always going to have... You're, you're doing something losers. right, man. If people are hating on you, you're doing something right. I, I swear <laughs> Um, if you know, the general consensus is that, you know, there's this overwhelming love and support, there's always going to be people that try to bring you down because they, you know, they, they can't see it in themselves to, to fight the, the battle that you're fighting, not just for yourself, but for all of us out here who struggle. Uh, I still struggle on a daily basis, man. Like there's some days where, you know, I have 
thoughts of being like, Hey, like, and, and even like on some good days, I'll, my thoughts be like, I, I don't want to be here anymore. Right. Like yeah. I, I legitimately live with that uh, sometimes day to day. And it's people like you, man, that, that just allow uh, us out here to, to see that we're not alone. And, um, you know, I try to do my best to share my story, uh, but there, it, it takes a, a, an army man to combat something um, with the magnitude of, of mental health, mental illness, substance abuse, addiction. To me, it kind of often ties hand in hand. If you're mentally ill or going through mental health struggles, doesn't mean that you're always going to, you know, turn to, to substances. But anybody that I've met that's in addiction or using substances has an underlying mental health issue and or mental illness. That's my experience. And I've come across thousands and thousands of addicts in my, in my travels. And, and, you know, whether... <laughs> doesn't matter how far down they go. It's like once you get kind of labeled as that, people become very quick to judge, um, you know, because they don't have an understanding and they don't really have that, that, that greater understanding of why that person is in that position in the first place. And I think that's a really important conversation that we all need to start having instead of being like, oh, that guy's a fuck up. <laughs> Excuse me. He's a loser or whatever. No. Um, uh, if somebody's willing to stand up, uh, for their own for their own health, for their own well being, but more importantly, what you've done, stand up for the greater good. I, I'm going to call you a hero again, man. And uh, I think when this documentary comes out, your life is is completely going to change, and and there's going to be so many um, doors that open for you, uh, and you're going to have just a significant impact. And I hope there's one day when when you can come. If you're ever in Canada, I know you're coming to, to Halifax, but I'm in Ontario. I'm in Muskoka. So it's a beautiful place up here. If you ever come up to Muskoka, man, um, I would absolutely, it'd be an honor to, to rollerblade beside you. I might have to get some of those fast rollerblades to keep up with you though. Looks like Bobby Ryan and those guys were in like Mars blades or something. And you're just like, see ya. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, yeah, they're honestly, man, they're, they're so fun. You gotta check them out. I'm, I'm going to have to, the rollerblade. I saw that and I was like, what is rollerblade? Like I hadn't even heard of that company until I saw you. I'm like, look at these skates he's got on. I'm like, he's going to be cruising this guy. But I, I didn't know for sure how much faster they are. Do you even own a pair of hockey rollerblades or is that all you got? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Of course, I always have to keep, keep play a pair of rollers on me. <laughs> what, what, about, what about hockey? Like I know concussions and stuff. What's your involvement with the game of hockey? Do you have any plans to to continue on to to use your story, maybe as a coach, a mentor, um, and uh, where are you at as far as being on the ice? Is that something that's hard for you to do, or you're told not to do? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I've I've been on the ice once um, since the bubble, and wow. uh, yeah, it was uh, it was an Aspen this past year actually playing some pond hockey with a buddy from college who lives up there and. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty awesome. Um, but other than that, I, I really haven't uh, haven't been on it. I, I want to eventually get get back into it in some capacity, but um, I don't know. It's it's kind of I, I have like a bitter taste in my mouth right now because I feel like I should should, should still be playing. I mean, I'm only 30 years old, just turned 30, so um, still feel like I'm in the prime of my you know athletic ability, in, <laughs> and uh, but I'm not able to play so. Um, I think once, you know, 35, 40 comes around, I think I'll be a little bit more, uh, I'll entertain that idea a little bit more, but for right now, I think I'm just going to try to figure out the, the, the life away from hockey for a bit. And I, I think that's fair. Um, I'll just tell you a lo little bit about what I went through. I didn't skate for 10 years and it was probably the biggest mistake of my entire life. I don't think I should have ever went 10 years uh, without being around the game, but I, I was very much like you. I remember watching uh, NH. I'm in jail watching, you know, guys I played with and against on the TV and, you know, not to sit there going, well, I should have been there. Guys that I fought, beat up, had more points. And I'm like, and I'm sitting in here, that resentment towards myself, towards hockey, um, trying to, you know, obviously, in my case, a lot of it, I was wanting to blame other people. It took really me to, for that accountability piece, obviously yours is an injury where it's, it's much different. Um, but I'll tell you, man, if, if you can get to that place and like you said, take a little bit of time off, um, and find that, that love for the game in a different direction where it's not so focused about, you know, us as players more than it is about just actually remembering that hockey is a game yeah. <laughs> and it's an incredible sport. Uh, but don't ever sell yourself short, man. Like you made it like you, yeah. you made it like you, you accomplished what every 
you know, hockey player wants to accomplish it. Maybe it didn't end uh, the, the way that you had hoped, but does it really ever end in the right way for anybody? Like even guys who play for 20 years, they yeah. leave the game and they still right struggle and have, and miss it. So it, you know, don't sell yourself short, man. You had a really great career, unfortunate injuries, and now you're set on a path to have a way bigger impact than you would have ever made playing in the NHL for another however many years. Let me tell you that. And I'm not saying that you didn't because you probably did great stuff in the community and all that kind of stuff, but now it extends way beyond the hockey world and you're opening doors and opening hearts and minds. And uh, it's really incredible to see. I want to get to a couple of comments. If anyone has any quick questions for, for Steven, you can throw them up there. Um, David Carlson watching and St. Albert says, hello, Jason Beaupre says, what's good. What's up, Jason. Uh, Michelle says, we are all grateful for you. Thank you, Michelle. Tammy Schultz chin in Michigan. Says good evening, everyone. Good evening, Tammy. Uh, Brody Kerberson just had it on the ice. Look forward to watching the episode once I'm done. Have a great show. Thanks, Brody. Doug Gilmore's older brother, Dave, watching. Says smile. Matthew Means are in Ushuaia, Argentina. All the way in an Ar Argentina. He's like the southernmost part of the world. This guy's incredible. <laughs> he makes hockey sticks for the locals. They're growing the game out of wood, growing the game for people. I talk about Matthew all the time. Just an incredible person. Says always entertaining, Brady. Always a great guest. Matthew also asked before, where can we find this documentary? We, we covered that earlier, hopefully. And, and just for people watching this, if you find this or, or listening to this after, as soon as the documentary comes out, I will have the information in this bio to the show. So if you're listening to this three months down the road, uh, four months, five months, whenever, just keep checking and I'll post it on socials and share it. And I'm sure uh, everybody will be as they did when, when Stephen started his journey across the States. Uh, Tom says, awesome stuff. Steve, look forward to seeing the documentary. He also says, great show. Lando, a young puck support warrior uh, down in Elmer. Actually, he's up here in Muskoka right now. I get to see him tomorrow. He says, really look forward to your documentary. Dave Maxim, who was uh, one of Bob Probert's best friends in high school watching, says, great job. Jen G says, yes, microdosing has helped enormously when needing a depression reset. So it's... Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people doing it, but I still feel like people are scared to talk about it because it's this, the, the war on drugs, the 60s, 70s. Oh, I don't want to do that because I'm going to trip out. Like, no, like microdosing, you, that doesn't happen. Um, Matthew says, I can't wait until it comes out. Very important. Thank you, Stephen. And my dad is watching, says, great conversation. I'd pay to see the doc. All right, dad. Um, newly hired by the Everett Silvertips. He's on his third Western League team in, in three years, so it's a good look for my dad and Everett. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can throw them up. Um, Steven, you have any last pieces to add? Uh, tell people, you know, kind of what you're doing in, in life outside of uh, the documentary and hockey because we talked a little bit about it and and sort of the community that you're, you're in now and, and what that's uh, done for you and your mental health, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, so, I mean, right now I'm just – I'm hanging out in the small town I, I grew up in. Uh, bought a house here through my first year pro and kind of come back here every summer. But ever, obviously now I'm just hanging out for a bit and uh, <clears throat> not doing much. Just spent a lot of time with my friends and family and got two nephews that live next door to me. And nice. I love, love seeing them every day and get to watch them in the morning tomorrow. So I'm on uncle duty, but I'm, I'm a good uncle. <laughs> and uh now, other than that, just I have a big charity golf event this this upcoming weekend. Um, we usually get thirty five to forty teams, and we wow. get together, and it's uh yeah, it's a big party, and we do the night golf before, and then uh, a big golf event on on the next day. So it's uh get a, I think there's like fourteen to fifteen people staying at my house for the weekend. So oh, wow, it's gonna be a bit of a, a, a an animal house. So looking forward <laughs> to it. It's always the uh, the best weekend of the year back here, and. Uh, yeah. What What do you guys What do you guys do it for? What charity? Like, what's the? Uh... So the so this is the eighth year we've done it, and uh, the first six years we did it for different cancer, and then we did it for the local fire department here, and then um, this year we're doing it for Mental Miles. So I love it. My dad would be that. happy with that. My dad's a retired firefighter, for like thirty five years, and I was actually out at a restaurant today, and it was like all firefighter stuff, and I'm sending him pictures and and everything else. So, but Mental Miles. Um, I was going to wrap it up, but 
what's the plan for mental miles is it, it lives on like it forever so is it uh, is that something that you're gonna continue on with and and what does that look like yeah so um i i don't, I don't really know i want to maybe hopefully start a foundation for after i think a lot of it comes from the documentary kind of see what comes out of that and uh you know, there's already talks about, I, I really want to bike from, from Maine to Florida or vice versa, Florida to Maine. So there's already talks about, uh, maybe a mental miles part two, but, um, we'll see. So, uh, I don't know. Cool. I, uh, the, the future is, uh, future is unknown. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. How, how much did it help you personally, the mental miles journey? Yeah, it saved my life. I was, uh, contemplating another attempt at suicide and yeah I, I think if jeff doesn't go on that journey with me and not 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 saying he saved my life but he he might have um i i was ready to to end it that day and when i sent him that text and told him i wanted to go across the country and he he wrote back and said i'm so down um yeah i think that's that's all that needs to be said there it's it was a life-changing experience that um yeah you know, i still i still go through I, my yeah go ahead can i ask you like this picture sorry if you're listening to the audio as most people do but there's a picture of, of steven and, and sorry my memory's so bad what was his name jeff Her, jeff totes yeah. sorry jeff sorry buddy um this picture of, of them sitting in the back of the pickup and there's coolers and and chairs and camping stuff and steven's got his rollerblades on what's going through your mind in this picture how, how, what state were you in in this picture? That's in my driveway. <laughs> so it's like five minutes before we took off. And, and mentally, where were you at? Honestly, I was just ready to go. Um, Excited. Yeah, I knew it was something. I was kind of one of those people growing up. If I set my mind to do something, I I did it until I accomplished that. And um, I knew this was a big task. And I was just I was just pretty pretty jacked up to get going. Yeah, the, the smile there says it all, right? Because that, and the reason why I asked you that is because you mentioned uh, the kind of the state you were in there the, the couple of days before and, and leading up, um, and and there you are, and it's sort of this new journey. Did it feel like you had this greater purpose all of a sudden, and and felt like just felt like you were doing exactly what you needed to be, and you were exactly where you were at that moment, and doing this, and and how much did that help you? Uh, with the transition out of hockey where you actually had to accept the fact that, you know, due to injury, now I can no longer play. Was this a big piece for that? Um, I think I was still trying to accept the fact. I mean, I think, still, watching the, yeah. yeah, I mean, watching the Stanley Cup go up every year, it's still, you know, it's still hard to watch. <laughs> and uh, just kind of one of those things that I think that will always be a little bit in the back of my mind. Um I know, I know that it's over. Um, there's always a little bit of, in the back of your head that's like, I could still play, but, um, you know. Did you enjoy a, playing? Like, did you enjoy yes. the process? Yeah. You loved it. Yeah, I, loved it. I, was, uh, I was truly in love with the game. I, it, there were times where it became a job for me. There were times where I hated it. I wish I wasn't playing, but, I mean, I – I loved it so much. It was, uh, I loved going to the rink two hours earlier and hanging with the boys and, uh, you know, throwing a chew in and talking about the, the night before. And it was literally like, I don't know. There was, uh, there's nothing like a hockey locker room. I mean, there's yeah, it, it's, and there's it's something hard. that you can, you can't replicate. It's yeah. Just tough. Yeah. Uh, but I really believe where one door closes, many more open. And you basically kicked that door open for yourself and for so many other people. And uh, once again, man, I just want to say a major thank you uh, to you uh, for doing what you've done and continue to do. And if there's anything, I don't know how much I can help you, but if there's anything that I can do or puck support, we're close to launching our charity up here in Canada for uh, substance misuse and, and mental health and suicidal ideations. Uh, we, we have a, a pretty good, good start at it. And, you know, I, I would love to, to continue this conversation on to see how maybe we can work together, maybe with mental miles or is you directly, if it's bringing you in to do some speaking stuff or to, to run hockey camps, I don't know, because 
I'm telling you, you have the capacity to to really change the world. And 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 together, I believe we are stronger. And I don't just mean you and I. I mean people watching, listening. This is something that we all need to pay more attention to and come together in our own communities, the community of hockey, whatever you want to, however you want to word it. But I, I really firmly believe, Stephen, that like up here in Canada, people are like, oh, our system's broken. We got to get the government to do more. We got to get this, we do that. And it's, I, I just strip all that away. And I say, listen, people need to take care of people in our own communities. And these are really important conversations to have. And once again, man, I'm, I'm super proud of you and really, really grateful uh, for your time. And I'm really happy uh, you're still here to tell your story because there's many as you can see behind me, there's pictures of hockey players and there's probably 35, 40 more that need to go behind me that are no longer here because they passed away from suicide or overdose. And, you know, you and I are both not on that wall and uh, we're here for for a, for a reason, man. And uh, I really think you're you're finding your purpose and it's it's exciting to watch. And uh I can't wait to see where this journey takes you. And if you ever need, I know you got a great support system, but you got my number. You ever want to call and let loose, man, and, and just shoot the shit off the record confidentially. I'm here for you anytime, man. And uh, really grateful uh, for your time. And maybe when uh, the documentary comes out, maybe we can do this again um, and, and talk more about it because... I got to be one of the first person to see it as soon as I, I'm going to be like set my reminder. <laughs> like a, one o'clock AM YouTube, like set pre-release. I'm like, yeah, I'm staying up all night to watch this. And I know a lot of people will too. So I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you having me on and thank you for everything you do. And thank you for giving me a, a platform to, to spread my message. So uh, hopefully Man, everyone is, you, yeah. you, you are a welcome guest here anytime dude I, I know i'm like what am i seven eight years older than you but i look up to you man you're you're it's it's good to have people uh to look up to and and inspire you and uh that's certainly the case uh here for me when i look back at, at you and what you've accomplished on the ice but more importantly off the ice and i'm going to say it one more time man so excited to see how this turns out so thank you Stephen johns you. we'll be in touch and and Watch out for the river, man. Don't lose your phone in the river. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it, brother. Okay, man. Have All a good right. night, buddy. See ya. All right, guys. That's Stephen Johns. Wow. What a great conversation. Make sure you follow him on social media. It's on the bottom of your screen. That's Instagram at S underscore Johns 28. Check out the hashtag mental miles uh lots of stuff that he's posted but i've gone through some of the posts and people out there rollerblading and sharing their stories it's uh it's pretty cool to see uh it's changing the world um, we're gonna hear from a quick sponsor uh, from the people over at pride tape shout out to dean and jeff over at pride tape wrapped up pride month here in canada and you know hockey again like i, I talk about pride tape and i have it on my stick i'll grab it after the uh i'll grab it after the uh, promo here, but it's about so much more. Uh, it's just about inclusion, equality. Hockey is for everyone. And uh, all my sticks, I use pride tape on the knob of my stick as an ally uh, to the LGBTQ2S plus, I think I said that right, community. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of shit still going on obviously in the world, but in hockey as well. I'm hearing stories all the time of people being uh, picked on and bullied and outcasted and feeling like they can't be their true authentic selves. And though I don't know what that's like in that capacity, I certainly can resonate with how that feels um, through the stuff that I went through as a kid, uh, you know, the sexual abuse and then being in school and hockey dressing rooms and hearing the homophobic slurs uh, and seeing people get labeled uh, probably 99.9% .9 of the time. It wasn't even on anything that was factual. It was just people being mean, kids being mean. And I don't blame those kids. I blame, you know, our, the communities, parents, teachers, and it's maybe not blaming them. But it's time for us to all start talking about this stuff and having those important conversations. What's your language like? You know, um, because when I heard those those slurs, 
uh, it really can confuse me and it made me just not want to talk about it. I'm like, well, <laughs> never telling anybody that because I see how, you know, whoever, I'm not going to use a name, how that's affecting them. Um, and based on something that's not even true. And if people find out what happened to me, well, hell, my life is over. And uh, that was a pretty dark place to be. So, you know, if we can all come together for the greater good, I'm talking about bullying, hazing, racism, sexual orientation, homophobic slurs, let's just treat, treat each other with love and respect and, and meet everybody where they're at and lift them up instead of kick them down. Pocket to Hell and Back is brought to you by Pride Tape. Pride Tape is a badge of support from teammates, coaches, parents, and pros to young LGBTQ players. It shows every player that they belong playing the sport they love and that we're all on the same team. Show your support for teammates, coaches, and fans in the LGBTQ community by wrapping your stick with Pride Tape. Every roll of tape will make an impact in sports and beyond. Inclusion starts with leadership. Check out some of the ideas of how you can get involved at youcanplayproject.org. Check out Pride Tape at pridetape.com. For more information, you can send an email to aubrey at pridetape.com. That's A-U-B-R-E-E, -E, Aubrey, at PrideTape.com. You can find Pride Tape on Facebook.com slash Pride Tape, on Twitter at Pride Tape, and at Pride Tape on Instagram. Pride Tape thanks all of you for being champions for change. Thank you to the amazing people at Pride Tape for supporting this show, supporting me personally, supporting Puck Support, they have a book coming out. I think it's set for release in August, and it's it's uh, all done through the NHL and everything. It's called uh, Hockey is for Everyone, I believe. Oh, man, I'm so forgetful. But I shared a little bit about it on my social media. I do have one of the first original copies that they've entrusted me with, um, which meant a lot to me. Um, but I can't wait for all of you guys to have a chance to read it because there's a very, very very powerful message within that book and it's a and it's a kid's book and the way that it's written is just it's done so well in a way where you can really understand it and there's one of my sticks this is one for the the, the backdrop this is one of the first sticks true sent me i just got some new sticks from true the hazardous px i know it says catalyst 9x in the bottom right corner but the new true stick comes out in four days, July 15th, the hazardous PX. And I'm telling you, this stick is lights out. Thank you to the beautiful people at True Temper Hockey. I don't even know if I'd be on the ice if it wasn't for them because I didn't have the money for sticks and skates and gear, you know, a year ago even. Um, and they've provided me with with everything that I've needed. And more than anything, the the support and the the friendships and the the dialogue back and forth. It's not something like here, just take this and run with it. They check in on me. They ask me questions about, you know, certain things. And uh, it's just really humbling uh, to have a, a great company like that backing me after everything that I've gone through and to see them and, and, and to know that they, they understand um, that, you know, maybe, yes, a lot of it maybe is my fault, but this can happen to anybody. And, you know, by, by people like myself and Stephen Johns and the countless of others uh, who have, you know, stepped up and shared their story, well, then that's where we're going to see lasting and impactful change. Um, just really uh, nice to see when, when companies like that that don't need to, they didn't need to do that for me, uh, but they did. And uh, I'll never, ever, ever forget it. So, Check out the Hazardous PX. And I'm not just saying that because, you know, they've been good to me. I, I'm not one of these guys that's going to lie and, and tell you something's good when it's not. Uh, or just because, you know, I don't I'm not getting paid to do stuff. Nobody could ever buy me. You could never pay me to be like, yes, this is the best or yes, this is great. If it's not, I, I just won't do it. I have something else really cool. I know this is the end of the show. And if you're listening, I'm sorry. Check this out. Check this fishing net out. Okay. Broken twig landing nets. If you if you're a fisher, men or lady, go check, go check these guys out. They sent me a Project X. Look at this. It's a Project X true, a broken 
a broken stick, converted into a net, and it's attached by a puck. I've yet to be able to get out there and use it. I'm hoping Brody and I can get out there and fish. Maybe my friend, a.k.a. Sherry Muskoka, my hairdresser, and her partner are going to take me out musky fishing. Never been fishing for musky. And uh, she reminded me that that net isn't quite big enough to catch a musky, but I'll try to get it in there anyways, right? Why not? Uh, next weekend, sorry, next Monday, I am going to be down at the minor family house slash compound. I don't know. It's a big house. They got a fishing uh, outfit down there. Tom and Michelle Miner, Lindsay and Zach and Haley and Harper and Ainsley. They've become like family to, to myself and to puck support. And, um, you know, they lost their son, Daniel to an overdose, um, uh, in early 2021. And they've just become a massive part of my life. And I'm really excited to get down there, uh, and, and see, um, how they live their life down there, get to go to the thirsty mate, which is a fish and chip spot, um, that Michelle runs. Um, and, uh, I heard they have some pretty good fish tacos. Anyone that knows me knows I love a good fish taco. We got a couple of comments. Oh, Lindsay's watching. She says, let's go. We can't wait. Hello to you all. I love you guys so much. I can't wait to see you guys. I was going to surprise Tom, Captain Tom, uh, but I'm not good with surprises. <laughs> Just not good with surprises. And Monday night, while I'm at the miners, surprise, I have to do a podcast. So maybe there's a spare bedroom I can sit in. Uh, I wasn't going to do one, but I got confirmation that a longtime friend of mine, who I've been disconnected from for quite a long time, a guy that I used to train with, who has had a very, very successful NHL career, um, is going to join the show. And I'm really grateful uh, for Andrew Ladd. Played a 1,000 games, hit his 1,000th game in the NHL this year, plays for the Arizona Coyotes. He's also the founder of the 1616 Foundation, supporting kids with mental health, uh, kids who are, are at risk, um, he's doing a lot of incredible work. And uh, here's a guy that, uh, wow, really showed me early on uh, what it took to be a pro hockey player. And though I wasn't able to take what he showed me to, to use it in my own life, I'll never forget watching Andrew Ladd uh, tell everybody, um, you, can keep, you can keep telling me no, but I'm going to believe in myself. He's going to tell his story through minor hockey, how he was denied from AAA teams. He was denied from junior B teams, from junior A teams, from WHL teams, until finally he got an opportunity. And guess what? That year he got drafted fourth overall. Fourth overall. Then he won a World Junior Gold. Then he won a Stanley Cup. Then he won another Stanley Cup. And he's had an incredible career. And I used to train with him in the summers, and he's probably going to tell you how much I didn't show up. Um, sometimes I would show up high on drugs or hungover or strung out, and I was really struggling. And, and him and Brandon Yip often would pull me aside and be like, hey, man, like, what's going on? You know, you could be a player if you just get your head around this. Um, but back then, I wasn't willing to tell anybody what was going on. And like Stephen alluded to earlier, um, what Stephen alluded to earlier um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a minute. I'll have to come back, address it next time. Short-term memory loss. Lindsay, Michelle, Tom, we'll see you guys soon. Greg Schooley now watching says, caught you late. Reppin'. The 519, if you're not following them on Facebook, go do so. Great interview from the Probert Ride. Got to meet Greg while I was down there. Thank you, Greg. Josh says, I need to update the stick for you in the corner. Can you please, Josh? Can you please? I would really greatly appreciate that. The last thing I want to say is there's been a lot of people um, that have helped me tremendously over the last couple of years in, in so many ways, and it would take me all night uh, to, to address them all. Uh, but I want to start doing this more on, on my podcast is really acknowledging people that have, that have helped me, uh, along the way. Um, you know, obviously 
my there's family and and people that have helped me but there's certain people that you know have come into my life that have just made the world of difference and one of those people is susan cook who's watching upstairs right now and i haven't talked too much about her she probably doesn't want me to talk too much about her but i still don't have my driver's license um i didn't have anything when when i met her she i i live in her house as many of you guys know um, but she goes above and beyond to to help me get to the places that I need to go um, to make sure that I'm organized uh, to the best of her ability because sometimes I don't give her enough time to for her to be organized and she somehow makes it work. She took me down to the Probert ride. She wakes up early and, and gets me so I can go coach these kids. And uh, Susan, I love you. Thank you. Um, it's uh, I, I maybe don't say it enough. Uh, but thank you because without you, I don't know how I'm making all this happen. Never mind all the work she does with puck support. If you've, if you've worn anything puck support, Susan's had her hands on it. There's no question about it. Uh, it's a team effort. Her and I. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a just a, a really fun, loving relationship. Um, and she's, you know, I'm, I'm aging her, but she's almost 70. Sorry, Susan. Uh, but she certainly doesn't, uh, she's walking towards me now. She certainly doesn't uh, act like a 70-year-old. There she is. Say hi. Thank you. Um, I do want to say thank you to a couple more people tonight, too. Um, Dan Spence, I alluded to this last podcast. But with... <laughs> Without Dan, I am simply not coaching hockey. There's absolutely no way that I'm coaching hockey. He picked me up off the side of the road in Muskoka. And uh, I had no teeth. I've shared this the last couple last podcasts, but he's like, doesn't matter. Come work this camp with me. You can talk to the kids. I'm like, what about the parents? He's like, don't worry, man. They're going to love it. And uh, that was two years ago. And it's taken me a year and a half to really start believing the fact that I could actually do this and actually have uh, an impact, um, you know, as a hockey coach and, and, and more than anything as, as a, a positive role model for these kids. And, you know, Dan really helped bridge that gap for me um, and it just brought me on the ice and, and introduced me to kids. And then it was left up to me to kind of prove myself and I think that I've I've done that and I continue to do that and I just feel so at home on the ice thank you Dan thank you Dan um, I've got a couple I just want to share a share a message uh, with you guys that I got today I got a couple of them from parents if I can find it. I'm a little teary eyed right now. I cried from this message earlier. Um, and this is another guy I want to thank is Bill Clark out in Owen Sound who has helped gather players for me and, and brought me groups. And last night he organized a, a group of 15 skaters in Owen Sound. And I was a little nervous uh, because Again, I didn't know any of these kids. Well, I thought I didn't. I actually knew like four of them because of Bill. I brought them somewhere else to work with me, but I didn't know the parents. I didn't know the rink. I didn't know the community. And full disclosure, I really had no idea what I was going to do. I tried to make a practice plan. Kind of had an idea, of course. I have a ton of drills in my head from when I played and from when I've coached, but I really had no idea uh, what I was going to do. And, 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 Brody Kerbison, who's going to watch this later, came out and he helped tremendously. Um, thank you, Brody. I couldn't have done it without you. Um, someone else, too, that I need to thank. Um, but I'll save that for a later date. Uh, I got this message, though, um, this morning. There's a couple I, I'll share over the next couple of days, but this one I shared on my social media. You may have seen it. It says, Bill Clark passed on your cell to me. My son Colby had a skate with you last night in Owen Sound. He is a tough kid to crack. It takes quite a bit for him to let people in, but I noticed he was comfortable with you right away. Comfortable in his terms. Anyways, 
I just want to tell you that you left a big impression on him. He was telling me all about you donating your hair and that you liked his flow. <laughs> he also asked if he has enough flow to donate because he'd like to do that now. Anyways, just wanted to let you know that you left your mark on him. It makes my heart happy. Enjoy the rest of your day. And to me, that's what it's all about. You know, I told these kids, I'm, I'm, I always tell them, thank your parents. They sacrifice a lot. I never thank my dad enough for all his sacrifice. I do now, but maybe still not enough. But hockey is a game, a beautiful game. And uh, I certainly got lost in it. I know a lot of people do. A lot of hockey parents get lost in it. More training, more of this, everything. But let's remember once again that hockey is a game and it's supposed to be fun. And I'll tell you, every time I'm on the ice, I'm having fun and I go above and beyond to make sure that these kids have fun and that they're not just learning hockey or hockey skills or working on that, that there's always a life lesson or many life lessons um, inserted into to the on ice. And I always extend myself at the end of practice to say, hey, just remember that you know, this doesn't end here. Now that, you know, you've worked with me, even if it's just this one time, you now have me in your corner. And again, I don't have all the answers, but I make sure that I, you know, will will be there for these players when, when the Zamboni comes on and I go in one dressing room with Brody or whoever's coaching with me and they go in the other dressing room and sometimes I don't see them, you're right. I'll leave or they've left the players and then I'm out the door. But I tell them all, find me on social media, get my phone number. If you have questions, your parents have questions, something good, something not so good, something at school. I don't care what it is. If you're on the ice with me today, then I'll be there for you off the ice any other day too. And that's something that I think we all need to do a better job at. And again, I don't have it all figured out. It's, um, it's just really, truly a gift. Um, I'm really grateful just to be back in the hockey community and and to have everyone's support and honestly I, I feel like I found a purpose and and that has saved my life if you want to do something if you have a dream if there's something that you want to accomplish or something that where your heart is just telling you like this is you know maybe the situation I'm in right now isn't the greatest and there's something else calling you go out and take a chance nobody's going to come knock on your door and be like hey I read your mind and you know, I can see that you want to do this. So here's this opportunity. You have to create that opportunity for yourself. And uh, it can be hard and it can be scary. But I'll tell you, it was the greatest decision that I ever made. I want to say hello to all my family back in BC, especially my kids, Brooklyn and Brody. I love you guys. It's been way too long. Although I did see, I'll share with you guys, and I haven't shared this with many people. I did see a picture of my son Brody, and he has hair just like mine. And uh, I don't know if that's by chance, but I'm almost certain he's seen pictures of me. And I'm not saying he has it because I have long hair, but I've never had long hair in my life. And to my knowledge, he's never had long hair up until now, too. Um, as hard as it was to see, um, it filled my heart as most that it possibly could. But I'll tell you, my heart is broken every single day. And not just for Brooklyn and Brody, I'm going through a lot of stuff in my personal life too right now. And uh, it's pretty tough waters to navigate, uh, but I know I'm going to get through it. Um, what do they say? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What didn't kill me used to make me angry. But now I think it just makes me stronger. And I hope that's the case for all of you. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up on yourself. If you have a loved one who is struggling, take some accountability. I don't, I don't know if accountability is the right word. Be proactive. Put yourself in the best possible situation to support that person. Sometimes we can't do that. Sometimes people, you know, we can't do much to help them. The onus lies on them. But I'll tell you, putting yourself in a position to, to understand or, or to the best of your ability to help you understand what uh, that person is going through, it allows 
it allows for healing to happen in many cases. So anyways, that's it. We'll see you guys next Monday, 8 p.m. with Andrew Ladd. Also have Dayton O'Donohue coming on the show. Young, 16-year-old. She's set out to go to Dartmouth. More importantly, she's on the NHL uh, Youth Advisory Board for Inclusion, uh, the uh, Diversity Alliance Movement. Incredible young lady. I got to meet her at the Rink of Dreams. And wow, is she ever (coughs) well-spoken. Excuse me. And an incredible young hockey talent. But I told her, the other day I said, yeah, you're going to accomplish a lot on the ice, but you've, what you're going to accomplish off the ice, you're changing the game and you're changing the way. And and again, like I said to Steven, like that's, it's way more powerful than any other hockey career or anything you can accomplish in sport, I believe, because really, yes, you win as a team, but you know, it f- makes us feel good to win, but how about making everybody feel good by doing something for the greater good. That's what impresses me. If you want to impress me, not saying anybody does, you want to impress me, be selfless. Don't look for always getting a reward or what's in it for me. Sometimes we just need to forget about our own personal selves, as hard as that is sometimes, and just try to be of service, whether it's to your friends, to your family, to a stranger, to the community whatever that looks like. Anyways, I'm going to shut up. I am tired. It was a long day yesterday. And uh, tomorrow I get to go to see my buddy Lando Snipes. He says, bring it tomorrow and we'll fish. Yes, let's Lando. Let's do that, man. We'll do that. We'll see you tomorrow. Uh, Troy Cass, Landon. We'll see you guys tomorrow. And hopefully we'll see you guys all Monday night, 8 p.m. If you're watching on Facebook, Please share it with your friends, like it. And if you really want to do me a favor, head over to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the YouTube channel and share that because I really want to grow the YouTube channel. If you're listening on audio, thank you so much. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all those places. If you're driving in your car on the way to work, I don't know when this is, when you're listening to it. Thank you for all your support. And I hope that you've heard something here tonight or today when you're listening to it. Uh, either on this episode or on a past episode that's uh, impacted your life, even if it's in a small way, because that was always the goal for this show. Anyways, good night. We'll see you guys next Monday. Until then, be kind. Always be kind. Be a good person. Be kind. Find gratitude in the little things. And always have a great day, if you so choose. I want the real stuff, everybody listen up Cause I'll only say it once, I'm gonna show you all the path If you want it bad, I'm gonna show you every side Yeah, how you can get it back, yeah, cause I ain't never done I'll be number one, working hella hard until I get just what I want Yeah, rise just like the sun, yeah, fade like a gun Shooter's gonna shoot and I'm gonna shoot until I fall yeah. yeah, let's do it on my own, so I gotta get through it And the only thing I know is to love what I'm doing Never give up, never slow till I finally prove it. Never listen to the nose, I just wanna keep moving. Yeah, I put out all the art, it's my only medicine. Yeah, everything I do, I'm just being genuine. Yeah, I'm sick of being screwed, feel my own adrenaline. Yeah, I do just what I